All right, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. Guys, come on. Amen. Welcome again to Discovery. We're in part three of a series called Anxious for Nothing, and we're really going on this journey. It's, not, we're, we're, it's a four-week series, but honestly, I'd love for you to think about this as one message across four weeks, because there's a lot to tackle with this topic of anxiety, different angles that we have to approach it, to truly live a life that the Bible says we can live, that we can be anxious for nothing. And, and even as I say that, I think about all the stuff that we can't be anxious for, like, like our future, our children, their school, our jobs, our finances, our health. There's so much that we can choose to be anxious for. So how do we do this? How do we how do we learn to be truly anxious for, for nothing? And I hope that you're grabbing this. We're, we, we have this theme verse. Every week I'm reading it to you. And I, and I am going to read it to you today. I'll read it to you next week as well because this verse is full of hope and promise. I want you to get it in your spirit to grab onto it. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything. Now the Bible would not say that. If that was not a possibility to set you up for failure, put an expectation on you that doesn't it even real or possible, like it is, you can be anxious for nothing, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that's what we're going after in this series, we're going after the peace of God to learn how to be anxious for nothing. A key truth, though, in this series is this. Anxiety is not a malfunction of your mind. It's just a signal. So stop treating anxiety as this unwarranted intruder in your life. Like, oh, man, like this thing. Why? It's not. It's nothing's wrong with you. You, listen to me, if you have anxiety, you need to understand, you are a child of God, a human being that has needs that need to be met. They are unmet, and God actually wants to meet them in Jesus' name. That your body's telling you something. There's an unmet need in your life. In this series, we've been talking about the four primary reasons we experience anxiety. If you have anxiety or ever had anxiety, it's probably because of one of these four reasons. We feel unsafe, uncertain unhealthy, or unaccompanied. Most likely our anxiety is coming from one of those four uh, reasons. And today we're going to actually be talking about the stress, how we carry the stress and the pressure of our life and how our health, our health affects our anxiety. For me, this is, this is mine, the unhealthy, the health version of where our body's given us signals. Because my body, my body will begin to shut down before my willpower or my mind does. I'll push myself to the limit. It's the reason why I can't do boot camps. I just can't. Because I will push myself beyond what I should, and I will end up throwing up or, or tensing up all jacked up, man. And, and, and that's just not physically. I don't just push myself physically beyond my limit. But in every area of my life, I tend to just push. And when I've, when I, when I got pressure, I just, I just barrel through. I'll push through. I can, I, can, I can handle it and deal with it. And then my body starts to break down before really my mind. My body starts... You guys, this literally happened two weeks, two weeks before. I'm preparing this sermon series and mapping it out. Two weeks before the sermon series, my left eye starts twitching. And I'm like, what is going on with my involuntary spasms here? And, and my body was telling me something. I'm like, I'm good, though. I'm fine. I'm like, I'm having time in God's presence, his word. My rhythms are good. Holy Spirit speaking to me and inspiring things to me. And yet this body signal. And I'm like, what's it, it caused me to kind of look in a little bit more. And I discovered the Holy Spirit shine the light on some areas of my soul that I was honestly holding on to some stress some pressures that, that I've been under, and even though I'm in God's presence, my soul is not releasing something, some, some pressure, my body is just alerting me going, hey, something's off, something's wrong. Today, the title of today's message is Choose Health and Healing. Choose Health and and healing. I'm going to present to you some choices today that are not new choices. They're not choices that you don't know, that you don't, like, I, I, everything I'm going to tell you today, you probably have already heard, but I feel like a prophetic messenger today. Like, you need to hear this. You already know it, but you need to hear it and heed it today, okay? 
I'm going to present you some choices that, that are honestly life-changing. If you actually would make the choice, it could change your life. Um, the choice of health and healing. Because listen, countless things have happened to you that you didn't choose. You didn't ask for and you didn't want. Like you didn't choose to be sexually assaulted. You didn't choose for your dad to leave you when you were seven years old. You didn't choose to see your friend shot and gunned down while you're on deployment together. You didn't choose the economy to implode. You didn't choose to get the email about your layoff. You didn't choose to have an egomaniacal boss. Those aren't choices you make. You didn't choose for people to hate you and exclude you because of your race or your, your financial position or because of your faith. You didn't choose your genetics. You didn't choose the trauma of your grandparents. You didn't choose the, the hell your mom went through when you were in the womb. There's so much you didn't choose that happened in your life, but you're here. And all the roads of your past have led you, and your family past have led you to this moment, to this place. There's so much you can't change, but you can choose for yourself health and healing. I hope to give you some ownership back to your life instead of being a victim to your past and your story. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 19 today. And in this text where we'll be studying, we're actually going to see all four of the primary reasons that we're studying of why we experience anxiety actually show up in the life of Elijah. All four. He had the all of them going on, which sometimes we all do. He, he was unhealthy, he was uncertain, he was unsafe, and he was unaccompanied. And so he was stressed and burnt out trying to push through a difficult season in his life. And he didn't choose it either. It wasn't a lot of his choice. It just was what it was, and he handled it in a very unhealthy way. Let me kind of give you some context before I jump into 1 Kings 19, because you need to know what he was sensing, feeling, and what he was dealing with in the last two chapters. So in 1 Kings 17, he proclaims this drought. And again, it's not something he chose. It was God's will to punish the nation of Israel because King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were idolatrous and worshipers of Baal and went against God. And, and so there was this drought. And so it didn't just affect the nation, it would affect him too. So he's like, starving. Everybody is starving. People are dying. Families are dying. He ends up in a van down by the river. No, I'm just kidding. He ends up in a brook, <laughs> in a brook, and, um, and, and he's hiding from King Ahab and Queen Jezebel because of this pronouncement of a famine in the land that's affecting everybody, even them and even the palace. And he's hiding out, and God's like miraculously feeding him, but just enough to kind of survive down there. So he's like running for his life. He's hiding. He's barely kind of surviving, getting by. God leads him to go to this widow's house. You remember the widow of Zarephath? And God does this amazing miracle where there's oil and flour, and it's multiplied, and God takes care of his needs and the widow's needs and the widow's son's needs during this famine just enough to get by to survive and he's surviving in this house with this with this widow and then first kings 18 shows up and that's the chapter where elijah has a standoff with the the false prophets of baal queen jezebel's false prophets 850 of them he actually has a standoff. God proves himself to be the only true, one powerful God Almighty. And then he kills 850 false prophets. He kills them all with the sword. And so here's, here's the, the, the scene that, that you need to see of what we're going to read in 1 Kings 19. He's stressed. He's worn out. He's burnt out. He's barely surviving. He just went through a traumatic experience of killing 850 false prophets and had to see all that. And like, so this is like, he's burnt out, man. And you're going to see it here show up. First Kings chapter 19, verse 1. Let's read this together. Now Ahab told Jezebel, that's King Ahab, told Queen Jezebel, his wife, what Elijah had done and how he killed all of her prophets with the sword in the previous chapter. So Jezebel sent the Facebook message to Elijah and said, and that's, I mean, she sent a messenger. That was their version. I'm just kidding. But that's, that's what we get. A, you might get a message. You might get an email. You, it just freaks you out. It scares you. You might get something. But this was their version of they got a report. They, he got a message. Okay? May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. If by this time tomorrow I don't make your life like one of them. Look how Elijah responds in his moment of weakness, burnout. Elijah was afraid and ran from his life. It's unsafe, right? 
when he came to Beersheba, remember that, we're going to come back to that. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. Big mistake. I'll deal with this all by myself. I'll just, I, know, I'll just, I got this unaccompanied. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down there, and prayed that he might die. I don't know if you've ever gotten to that place before, but I pray that this message today and this series ministers to you greatly. Or maybe you've said or you out loud or to yourself what he said, I've had enough, Lord. Do you ever feel that even? Like, I'm just done. I'm, I'm done with this. I don't know how much more I can take the uncertainty here in Elijah. I've had enough, Lord. And he said, take my life. I'm, I'm no better than my ancestors. I thought I could be different. I thought I could live this life. I thought I could, you know, live for you. And I, but I guess I can't because I just can't take anymore. See, when you're stressed out and you're overworked and you're overloaded, when you're unhealthy, like mentally, physically, emotionally, the alarms will start going off. And Elijah senses the alarms and he just responds in an unhealthy way and runs and isolates himself. There's a few things that are going to happen when you're stressed out and when you're unhealthy. Will you take some notes with me? Here's what's going to happen. When you're unhealthy, your resistance actually lowers. Your resistance lowers. Let me say it this way. Whenever you're stressed out to the limit, you're overworked, you're not resting, you're not slowing down, and you're in this hurried pace, your ability to say no, especially to sin, is at its lowest. You make your worst decisions. You know it when you're tired. You make your best decisions uh, when you're rested. And it's not, it's not only your resistance is lower to sin, but you're actually... The, the, the science proves this, that when you're stressed out and you're overworked and you're unhealthy, your resistance to illness is lower. And it's no, it's no coincidence that I got sick two weeks ago. I haven't gotten sick like this in three years, you guys. Three years I haven't. Usually I get sick 24 hours. I'm good, man. I, give me some zinc and vitamin C and rest and I'm, I'm ready to go, okay? But this hit me, man. And it's no coincidence that I was like carrying my stress and, and I was just in an unhealthy place, to be honest, man. And, and I got my resistance to illness was lowered and I got... I got sick, man. Here's what the Bible says, Luke 21. Be careful. Or your hearts, Jesus said, will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness. And look what he says. Your hearts will be weighed down by the anxieties of life. And that day will close in on you suddenly, he says, like a trap. Suddenly. You didn't know it was going to happen. It just snuck up on you. And one day your eyes started twitching. Is this just me today? Am I preaching to myself today? <laughs> okay. Here, write this down. When you're unhealthy... Your emotions are inconsistent, aren't they? You're like easily angered and irritable. People are even telling you at this stage, they're like, you, man, this ain't like you. You're even thinking to yourself, that's just, that's just not like me. This, this isn't me. And you're flying off the handle. And Job, Job says it like this in Job 9, 25. He says, my days go by faster than a runner. They fly away without me seeing any joy. So yeah, you're, you're unhe unhealthy, stress. It's, it's robbing you of joy in your life, and you're out of character. You're saying things you don't normally say. You're doing things you don't normally do. And if that's the case, listen to me. This, it may be a red flag. It may be a sign that, that you're unhealthy, and there are some things that you need to check. When I'm unhealthy, also, write this down, my productivity suffers. You're just not as productive as you think you are. You think by working harder, you're, you're getting more done, but it doesn't work out that way. You're working more, and you're getting less done. Right? That's what happens when you're unhealthy, you're stressed out, you think you're going, let me just work harder, and you're like getting less done with your efforts, and it's the principle, right, of sharpening the saw, because you think you got this dull axe, and you're just like, yeah, I can't stop, I gotta, I gotta get this thing down, and if you just stop and sharpen your saw, you can get that down in a few swings rather than the thousands you're wasting. Proverbs 21, verse 5, careful planning puts you ahead in the long run. Hurry and scurry it just, you're getting further behind the more you try to tackle it and handle it and barrel through on that thing. You're just, we're unhealthy. How about this? We're un, when we're unhealthy, our life loses meaning. And this is where Elijah finally, he's getting to this place of his stress and, and, and his unhealthy uh, life pace um, that he just loses perspective. This, I mean, this is Elijah. He's, he's seen God move and speak and been used by God to make a difference in the world and the nation, and then even in, in individual people's lives and families' 
lives. And, but then in the moment of his weakness, in the moment of his, 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 unhealth, his stress, his load and unhealth, he loses perspective and he's like, I just can't see it. I just don't even want to go on any further. Your life will lose meaning when you become unhealthy. Psalm 39, verse 6, we're merely moving shadows and all of our busy rushing Ends in nothing. That's what it feels like at the end of our rush, rush, rush. Go, go, go. Just just handle it. It feels like nothing. And ultimately, here's where Elijah's at. When we're unhealthy, our relationship with God seems distant. It seems like he's far away. It feels like it. Because the way that I'm carrying this and the pace of my life, it feels like he's far away. But, But whenever, listen to me, whenever he feels far away, it's not because he moved, right? It's because we do. We, we drift. Psalm 46, 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. You got to just stop the pace. You, we're unhealthy. We're running and trying to figure it out. Maybe you're in a similar place as Elijah today. You're stressed out. You're on the verge of burnout. And you're thinking, I've had enough, Lord. I don't know how much more I can take it. And I didn't choose this. I didn't choose this. I, wanna, I want you to internalize this deeply. You are worth more than the worst thing that has ever happened to you. You are worth more than the worst choices that you made. You are worth more than the stories you inherited. That does not have to be your identity, your legacy, or your story. And and you can't change what happened to you. Those moments are gone, but you can choose what happens next. And this is the truth. Write this down. The distance between the truth I know... And the truth I live equals the pain I experience. And some of you are going through some pain right now, but it's not because you don't know the truth. I'm going to give you some truth today, some choices today for your healing, for your health. You already know. But the reason why you're experiencing pain still and you're stuck still and you're feeling like, I can't handle God, I'm done with this, isn't because... You know the truth, it's, not, it's because you're not doing the truth that you already know. Got to make a choice. Now, unless you're some kind of robotic superhuman, you can't like snap your finger and then the countless layers of, of you know, stress and, and stuff that you built into your body, the stuff that your body is accumulating, all that stress and anxiety and you're putting it through, it doesn't just like evaporate and disappear. So in the beginning of our journey toward being anxious for nothing, you can't choose how your body responds, but you can choose healing from this day forward. Like, like for instance, you can choose to see a professional counselor. You, you can choose to grieve. You can choose to move out. You can choose to say yes or no. You can choose to develop and practice healthy boundaries. You can see a medical doctor and get blood work done. You can choose to get a personal trainer. You can, you can choose to forgive. You can choose to write that letter. You can choose to get that training, get that degree. You can choose to move and get a new job. The choice of healing and health is about deciding to face your anxiety, to face your trauma. This is about changing your family tree, creating a new legacy for yourself and your family. I, in my research, there is this best-selling author named Terry Real. I love what he says. He says, family dysfunction rolls down from generation to generation like a fire in the woods, taking everything in its path down until one person in one generation has the courage to turn and face the flames. That person brings peace to their ancestors and spares their children that follow. If you're the first person in your family that's going to make this choice to choose health, to choose healing, listen to me, you're going to have scars. You're going to have pain and scrapes and burns. And as you battle the forest fire and carve out out a new path in the wilderness, but your children won't. And their kids and their neighbors, and people that you don't even know will walk on the new paths that you carved out in the darkness of that wilderness. Choosing health and healing is about doing whatever it takes to change my legacy, to not be a victim to what has happened to me, but choosing the life that I'm going to live from this day forward. It's choosing health, choosing healing. This is the path. You and I, we have to walk through the flames and the fire, and carve out a new destiny. If you want to live anxious for nothing, this is a choice that you and I have to make. You have to choose. 
health and healing. Let's pick up this story in verse 5, verse, chapter 19, verse 5. It says, Then Elijah, he lay down under a bush and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. The angel of the Lord actually came and prepared a meal for him, a miraculous meal. He ate and drank and lay down again, fell asleep again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey. I got a journey I want to take you on, but it's too much. You can't handle it right now. So he got up, ate, and drank. And strengthened for, by that food, he actually went on the journey. So I want you to see something here in this story. That, that God did not have for Elijah a spiritual solution. At this point, there was no spiritual solution to his isolation and his fear. And his, he didn't give him no, it wasn't a spiritual or emotional solution. It was a physical solution he gave him. He, this was priority number one, prescription one. He said, I got a journey to take you on, but you're not healthy enough to go on the journey. I need to get you physically healthy. Listen, this is why it's so important. Some of you are trying to fix something and you're too sick to fix it. You're too unhealthy. God has a journey for you. He's got more for you, but he can't even give you the revelation yet because you're too unhealthy to receive it. You're like a surgeon with a flu. You want to cut me up like that? Go get right. Go get healthy before you do surgery on me. You need, you need, to, you need to get healthy. I love what this author, Stephen Elardi, he wrote a book called The Depression Cure, a powerful book. He said this, when uh, we were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, socially isolated, fast food laden, sleep deprived, frenzied pace of modern life. How many of you know we were never made for that, okay? This is our culture. This is our world that we're living in. And while you might, you might go to a doctor and get like a short-term fix with a pill or something, the answer for most of us is not a pill. It's a lifestyle change. It's a new choice. It's a new choice. A choice of healing. A choice of health. So can I just get really practical with you today? And as the angel of the Lord led Elijah to get to a place that he could take him on a spiritual journey? Can I just get really practical with you and care for you the way that the angel of the Lord cared for Elijah and tell you some things that you already know? But today, I hope you heed it. Amen? Let me give you five healing choices. This is just out of this, right here, I'm gonna give you the first three out of the scriptures we already read, then we're gonna continue the story, and I'll give you the next two. Five healing choices that you gotta make if you wanna be anxious for nothing. Number one is this, I will choose exercise. Come on, somebody, write that down. I will choose exercise. You know, doctors say 10 minutes of walking is better than any antidepressant on the market. That the, that the endorphins that are released through that is better than anything you can actually take. Another doctor I, I read, Peter Adia, he's a world-renowned physician, a longevity expert, best-selling author. He describes exercise as the single most important longevity drug in the world. Like he, he explains that there isn't a drug known to man that decreases all-cause mortality, like the likelihood you're just going to die, better than exercise. Like you must regularly and consistently exercise and move your body, period. The problem is, though, we're just sitting down and sedentary more and more as, as, a, as a human race, as a people. Okay? But if people will just get off their butts, you would be so much healthier. Just, just even the walking like rewires your brain. It actually controls that, that your walking and movement controls your threat assessment in your brain. The, the part of your brain that controls threat assessment, your anxiety levels, is controlled by your exercise, your body movement. And the less you move it, the more threat assessment. Your brain is going, something's wrong, something's wrong. This doesn't sound too spiritual. I'm telling you just what God told Elijah. You need to get healthy. Let me, let me give it to you in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul says of his own life, he says, so I run with purpose in every step. And I'm not just shadow boxing. Look what he says. I discipline my body like an athlete. Well, I don't need to exercise. You know, I'm not an athlete. I don't do sports. I don't, I don't. No, no, no. Apostle Paul was not an athlete either. He was a child of God. He said, I discipline this thing, like an athlete. Look what he says, why? Training it to do what it should. 
because my body don't want to do what it should. My body wants a cookie. My body wants, wants it all. My body wants to relax and chill and sit down. But this body, I don't listen to this body. I listen to my Lord. I'm just, well, I'm going to discipline, discipline this body so that it will do what it should. Otherwise, I fear after preaching to others, look what he says, I could be disqualified by this body just as it was Elijah running away from his calling because of his health level. He wasn't healthy. He was spiritually strong. Man, just, just fought off all these prophets, called down fire from heaven. It wasn't a spiritual problem. It was a health problem. And his body was disqualifying him. When you discipline your body, you regularly exercise, I'm telling you, it can change. It'll change your brain. It changes the, your, your depression levels, anxiety levels. It just... There, According to the CDC, let me offend you some more now. According to the CDC, the prevalence of obesity among adults in the United States was 42.4%. This was just, what, I think two years ago was the report, a year and a half. That was up 10% from last decade, up 10% the decade before that. And there is no statistics on this the decade before that because it wasn't a problem. It was so uncommon. It just was not measured. And this is attributed, they say, to our lifestyle. It's our, it's our diet and lifestyle and the environmental factors socially, like our isolation and our loneliness. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your what? Your bodies. God wants you to offer your body as a living sacrifice, as holy and pleasing to God. And this is your spiritual act. Of course, did you know that the way you offer your body to God is a spiritual act of worship? When you look at your body, how you feel in your body, how you treat your body, can you honestly say it is an instrument of worship for God? Because it's worshiping something. What is your body worshiping? Here's the takeaway. Your takeaway is to do some sort of movement or exercise every single day. I told you this isn't anything new that you need, but it's something you need to hear. We need to get healthy because God's got more for your life. You can be anxious for nothing. There's some choices we got to make. You didn't choose a lot that happened to you, but you can choose today health and healing. You can choose exercise. Number two, you can choose sleep. <laughs> some of you are like, that would be nice. Some of you are most researchers, researchers actually put this as a very, 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 very close second to exercise, as that being as much of an impact on your life and your health. Loss of sleep, poor sleep, insomnia, all that directly links to anxiety and anxiety, anxiety related disorders. It is accurate to say the less sleep I get, the more anxious I'm bound to feel. This is the prescription that the angel of the Lord gives to Elijah. He's like, I got a journey for you. You're going to have to walk a long way, but you ain't ready for that thing. Sleep. Take a nap. Take another nap. This is just, this is what he's doing for Elijah. Psalm 4 and 8 says, in peace I will lie down and sleep for you alone, Lord. Make me dwell in safety. Very few of us get enough sleep. Now, if you're here today and you think, no, you think you're doing good on four or five or even six hours of sleep, you're lying to yourself. You're lying. If you have even a single drink before bedtime, or if you, if you take sleep medications, or you stay up until midnight putting your eyes on some kind of screen, your sleep is going to be dysregulated and disrupted. Now, if you do that for a short period of time, you're choosing. Remember, you're choosing something. You got to make the right. You're choosing something here. You can't choose a lot, but you're choosing this. When you do that for the short term, you're choosing to be irritable, forgetful, erratic, <laughs> anxious, and not your best. That's what you're choosing. If you choose that for the long term, you're making a choice. You're choosing, listen to me, you're choosing to die early and be anxious. That's what you're choosing. What's the takeaway here? Our takeaway? Seek to get seven to nine hours of sleep every single night. We got to build our life around adequate sleep. Most of us, though, we build our life around more. More money, more stuff, more pleasure, more enjoyment, and then sleep is an afterthought of whatever more you're trying to go after. This is not the rhythm God has for you. If you want to be anxious for nothing, you got to make some better choices here. You got to choose health and healing. You got to choose not just exercise, but you got to choose sleep. 
to live your life from a priority of getting adequate rest. The third healing choice, I will choose nutrition. I'll choose nutrition. Again, this is just, this is what the angel Lord is telling. It's not new to you, but sometimes we get out of alignment. We ain't making the good choices. Elijah wasn't making the good choice. And he says, you need to eat, boy. Get up, here's some meat, take a nap, here's some more food. Get the right nutrition. Look, you're not going to suddenly die if you eat processed foods occasionally or if you grab a donut from the, from the lobby. You ain't going to die immediately But you, if you grab a donut, but you don't need to grab three. And you don't need a donut every day. Okay, I'm just, you, so you're not going to, some of us aren't doing it occasionally. We're doing it consistently. You need, you need enough fuel. Your body needs real, unprocessed whole foods. And you need enough protein to fuel your body. You need the right amount of carbohydrates and, and good fats. And, and we're living in a world today that if you follow the world's plan for you. If you follow what the world says you need and what's good for you, what you need to eat, what you need to do, where you need to go, if you follow that plan, listen to me, you will be anxious and obese. This is the plan that the world has for you. It just, it just is. We, we all need to get more intentional and I think more, maybe more educated in what your body needs. If you want to be anxious for nothing, if you want to choose, you want to make a choice here for health and healing, for your future, for your legacy, for your story, you got to make a different choice. God cares about your health and body. You know that? He cares. Look what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, do you not know that your, again, what? Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you've received from God, that you are not your own. Your body doesn't even belong to you. That's not yours anymore, because you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. This is God's temple. I should treat it as holy. This is a whole different message. It's just nothing is holy anymore in our world. Nothing is holy or sacred anymore. We treat nothing as sacred. Parents are not sacred. Employment's not sacred. Values aren't sacred. There is no holiness standard in the world, and I'm going to get on it. But, but we're treating our body, Des like putting things that are desecrated. In. And again, I'm not saying... Man, I love sweets. You know me, man. But I know how much I can, how much I can and can't do. I'm going to keep this body in check and disciplined. Okay, so let me give you, before I give you the other two choices, let's continue reading. Verse 9. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah. What are you doing here again? He says, what are you doing here, son? I love this. God, God's like, hey, son, what are you doing here? What's going on? He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and Put your prophets to death with a sword, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. This was a lie, by the way, that he believed somewhere, because this is not the truth. God would eventually correct it, but he believed a lie. Next verse says, the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a whisper, a gentle whisper, where, where we quiet down the noise around you and inside you enough to hear the whisper of God. Here, here's the fourth healing choice. Write it down like this. I will choose rest. Now, I know you already wrote sleep, but just because, just because you sleep doesn't mean you're rested. Because rest comes from peace the peace of God that transcends all understanding. And so we need to learn how to cultivate the presence of God in our life to, to remove those distractions outside of us and inside of us to hear the gentle whisper of God. You need to find what I call the pace of grace in your life. There's a different pace that God wants you to live where you're walking and listening to him. Psalm 73 says, when I tried to understand all this, like, I tried to figure it out. He said, I tried to solve it. I'm just going to solve this. I can, I can work it out. He said, I was troubled deeply until I entered the sanctuary of God, until I got into the presence of God. See, in this place, you guys can, I know you sense God and you hear God and you, you're, you're, you can sense him here in this place, but there's six other days outside of this building that, that you're, you need to learn how to listen and find this pace where you're hearing the voice of God. 
You, you ever heard it said, all is well that ends well? I don't, I don't think there's a truer statement. I like the statement, all is well that begins well. If you would just begin your day, and if you begin your day from rest, from this place of hearing from God, begin there, I think it would actually set, set things in order in your life. I call it the first 15 of your day, the first 15 minutes, worship, prayer, the word. Get into it. Just worship, word, prayer, five, five, five. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Just those first 15 minutes of your day. And I'm telling you, you start it with God. You should, we should be living our day from rest, not for rest. And some of you, you think rest is something you earn after a long day's work. You put in a lot of work, and you're like, okay, and I feel like I was productive today, and you rest. That's actually not the rhythm of God. That's not the pace of grace. You should be working from rest, not for rest. So we need, to, we need to choose this. We need to choose rest, be anxious for nothing. Let me continue the story. Verse 13, when Elijah heard this gentle whisper, he, look what he did. He pulled the cloak over his face. Your face represents what you believe about yourself, your identity. So God's pulling him close, but he's still a little bit, he's, he's like pulling the cloak over his face. And he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then the voice said to him again, what are you doing here, son? What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword, and I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. That sounds very repetitive. I'm not reading the same thing. He actually says it again. He repeats the lie again to God for a second time. For some of you, the reason why you're anxious is because you've talked yourself into a lie that's not true. And you've rehearsed this lie. You've gotten good at even telling it. You know what to say and how to say the lie that you've told yourself and convinced yourself. Well, where does this come from? It comes from a few places. It comes from, one, what people are saying to you about you. And I'll say it mainly in the form of social media. And some of you have been convicted about this, the way that social media makes you feel. And I feel like I'm a messenger of God today, giving you confirmation of what he's already told you. And here's what I want to tell you. It's time to get off it. It's time to get off it, to limit it. I, I've removed it from my phone entirely. I just use it to encourage people and to uplift people. But so, so people come up to me every now and then. They're like, hey, did you hear about it? I'm like, nah, I didn't. I didn't hear nothing. I didn't hear nothing. I don't care to hear it. In fact, don't even complete that sentence because I don't even care to hear what you're talking I don't need to know. I don't need to know. I don't need to. It's called selective ignorance. You know what I mean? You need to select what you're ignorant about. You're going to be ignorant about something. You just got to select what you're ignorant about. You got to stop listening to the voice of the haters and debaters. Quiet things down in your life, Elijah. You're, you're giving too much ear to the wrong messages and, and just quiet it. You, need, you want some peace? You got to get healthy. But it's not only what others are saying about you. It's what you're saying to yourself. The, the research says this. 95% of the emotions that you feel are determined by actually what you're saying to yourself. Let's continue. Verse 15. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Remember, that was Beersheba. That's the place of the oath where he made his oath, his covenant with God. God tells him, go back to where you started, and I need to re-up from you. You ran away. You're trying to run from your calling, trying to run from my calls. you. I'm not finished with you, Elijah. Go back and re-up the covenant you made because we're not done. Go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, I got more work for you. You're my, you're my prophet. You're mine, Elijah. Go anoint Haziel, king, and then in the next verse, go anoint Jehu and anoint Elisha. He's going to be the one that succeeds you. He's telling Elisha, Elijah, I got more for you. You're not done. One of the best things that you can do for your stress, your anxiety and stuff is just start making a difference with your life. Put, put something of purpose in your life. Be used by God in your life. And then it goes on. Verse 18, God says, yet I reserved 7,000 in Israel, 7,000 prophets. You thought you were alone. I've reserved 7,000, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, whose mouths have not kissed him. So here's what he's telling Elijah. You need to renew your God-given sense of purpose, but I need you to anoint some more people to do it with you because you can't do it alone. Here's the choice. I will choose support. I will choose support. I'm not going to do it alone anymore. If you continue reading the story, Elijah went out and found Elisha, and he, he actually throws his cloak over his shoulders, which is when, when someone would do that, that's a sign of a covenant relationship. He's bringing them close into a covenant relationship. He left his servant behind when he first was stressed out and running, which was the wrong choice, and now he's bringing someone back close to his life. Did you know that your IQ drops 30 points when you're isolated? You are literally dumber when you're alone. 
And you're like, I got this. No, I just, I don't need any help. I'm just, I'm just sure you can, you can probably figure it out. But it's just, it's going to be a more stupid solution than you, if you had other people around you. You can't live your life alone. And not only do you need the support of others, but listen to me, you need the support of God to sustain you. I love how God, he comes, he comes to Elijah and he wants to know what's inside of him, what he's feeling. What are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here, son? Where, where, where are you at? I think God is inviting some of you close. He's inviting some of you close again to hear the whisper of his gentle voice. But it's almost like before you hear that, you got to get some things off your chest. He's like, come on, tell me what's going on, Elijah. Get it off your chest. Psalm 32, 3, it says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away. Like my body was affected when I tried to hold this in, groaning all day long. The longer I was silent, I tried to hold it in. I acted like I didn't need anybody or need help. My body started giving me signals. Let me say it like this. If you don't talk it out to God, you'll take it out on your body. Your body feels it and will know it. It's a signal. Some of you are getting signals in one way or the other that you're unhealthy. It's time to listen to what God's trying to tell you. You didn't choose a lot in your life, but you're here. And your identity and legacy doesn't come from what happened to you, but what you choose to do. Let me give you one final verse. Not in your handouts, right up here on the screens. Look at it with me. God says, this day, and I want to I just speak that to you, this day, this day, this day, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you today life and death, blessings and curses. And God says, can I give you a hint? Choose life. You can choose that. You didn't choose that. You didn't choose them. You didn't choose that part. But you can choose this. You can choose life. You can choose blessing. You can choose health and healing. You can, you can choose to turn around and face the, the forest fire, blaze a new trail in that wilderness. You can choose a new legacy. You can choose your identity. The identity God has for you. What he says you are. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.